Uh, those songs just flow right in line with Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9. I'd invite you to turn there. And uh, typically, the, the one who has prepared to open God's word gets the fullest benefit from the songs because the lyrics of the songs resonate with what has been studied and, and what my own heart is, is filled with. But just think about the line we just sang, ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriend thee. Uh, th- that is right in line with the, what I would say, heartbroken prayer of Daniel the prophet in Daniel 9. As he is sitting in Babylon, far away from home, 81-ish years old, having been removed from his home and the special dwelling place of Yahweh since he was a teenager. And watching the state of the people of Israel in exile, in desperate need of thoroughgoing heart repentance, getting reports of those still in Jerusalem who are yet wayward and aware of those who have been taken to other lands altogether, still in a terrible spiritual state. And all of that with the backdrop of what could life had been like? If the people of Israel had yielded yielded themselves in faithful obedience to Yahweh, the Almighty, think anew, ponder anew, think again what the Almighty could do if with His love He befriend thee. We're going to see these themes played out in Daniel's prayer. We introduced the setting of Daniel's prayer last week and And this is a good introduction to the prayers of the Bible. I hope that you are feeding your own heart, observing how uh, the authors of Scripture themselves pray. Oh, I can't help it. Evie just, Evie's here. Hi, kiddo. Shout out to my daughter who just got back in town. Good to see you. Um, To read the prayers of the Bible is simply thrilling and invigorating. Those who are steeped in the richness of God's truth and then pour out those truths from their very hearts. You read the Psalms. These are prayers in our Bible. You read the Apostle Paul's prayers in the Bible. And you get the amalgam of joy and confession of sin and hope and anticipation and expressions of need and worship. And the prayers of the Bible are so informative. This one here in Daniel 9, I fear, is underrated, underread, underprayed. And sometimes perhaps the prayer in Daniel 9 is overshadowed by the end of Daniel 9 and Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, which is critically important. Uh, That 70 weeks prophecy is the backbone of biblical prophecy. It will be important for us to study that and we will get there, but not too fast. We have some things to learn from observing Daniel's prayer here and and not to learn as disinterested observers, as uh, some sort of students in an ivory tower way, but to learn as prayers, to learn to pray even as Daniel prayed. We'll learn something about the pattern of prayer from this prayer in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel follows a, a pattern of adoration and confession and petition. That is, he begins by worshiping God for his attributes and then confessing his own sin and the sins of the people and then asking for help. That's a good pattern. We see that over and over again in Scripture. And what's most striking to me in Daniel's prayer is Daniel's utter dependence on the Word of God in his prayer. It becomes very clear that Daniel has got Deuteronomy in his heart. The language of Deuteronomy comes out in Daniel's prayer. No doubt you've noticed the elders of Grace Bible Church praying in our elder prayer time on Sunday mornings and often reflecting. Many of the men will will say, I'm going to allow such and such a psalm or this chapter of Romans to inform our prayer together this morning. And the elders there are modeling something that I believe Daniel here is modeling, reflecting on truths of Scripture and letting those things flow out in the way you think and even how you worship and confess and petition the Lord. So the theme of this chapter is, as we looked at last week, as the Babylonian exile neared its end, Daniel prayed. 
Remember, Daniel wasn't just content to bank on prophetic truth. Seventy years in the exile's up. Okay, let's have a countdown and a party. No, Daniel recognized that the spiritual state of the nation was in dire need. God had to do a remarkable work, or else the idolatrous hearts of the people that brought them into exile in the first place would never have their fundamental problem solved. Here's the outline of Daniel's prayer we'll look at this week and next. Adoration, confession, petition. And Daniel's words here in this prayer are borrowed words. It seemed that Daniel had Deuteronomy tattooed on his heart. The language of this prayer is steeped in the message of Deuteronomy. And so what I want to do this evening is give a little bit of the flavor of Deuteronomy, its themes and its purpose, so that we can see how it fleshes out in Daniel's prayer. This will serve as a model for us, and I think in an encouragement in how all of our Bible is held together. Deuteronomy is simultaneously Israel's constitution and the Old Testament's Romans. What I mean by that is Deuteronomy sets out for the nation of Israel how to have a right relationship to Yahweh, and it is done as a sermonic appeal to the people to be faithful to Him. It is the foundational document relating the people of Israel to their national rulers and to their God. And it is also an appeal at the individual level for people to be right with God by faith. Israel was a unique nation designated by God as a theocracy, and it began with a simple, small family. Abram called out of the Ur of the Chaldees, and then a small family of 70, entering an incubation period of 430 years under the mighty Egyptian empire, and they had their Independence Day, the Exodus, and then they had their constitution, the Torah, That foundational document which set out what it meant for Israel to be related to God and for God to be their king. How should they respond? What would God do for them and what should they do in relationship to God? And Deuteronomy is the capstone of that constitutional document. In fact, I would call Deuteronomy something of a prophetic sermonic constitution. Or maybe a prophetic constitution in sermonic form. And I want you to understand the relationship that Deuteronomy has in our Old Testament. Deuteronomy lays out foundational things that all of the prophets of the Old Testament appeal to. Deuteronomy says, do this, don't do this, here's your God, there is no other. And the prophets say, there's no other God. Remember, don't forget. Remember Deuteronomy, don't forget what Deuteronomy said. And they make appeals to that foundational constitutional reality. The prophets appeal to Deuteronomy, perhaps like politicians and judges in our day appeal to our constitution, or maybe as we wish they would. The remember and forget language is all over Deuteronomy, and then it's all over the prophets. Do not fail to remember. And the prophet's refrain is, you have forgotten. Another refrain throughout Deuteronomy, and we'll look at this later this evening, is the the phrases, listen to do. Listen so as to keep. Keep so as to observe. Be careful that you do. These listening words and keeping words and obedient words are all linked together in Deuteronomy and they find themselves again throughout the Old Testament. They find themselves here in Daniel's prayer. Deuteronomy says, listen and obey and love Yahweh with all your heart. And the prophet said, you're not doing it. And Daniel's prayer is, We didn't do it. Forgive us. Deuteronomy is Moses' last words to the people before he died. He himself did not go into the land of promise, at least not yet. Deuteronomy as a sermon represents Moses' broken-hearted appeal to the nation. I know how you've been with me, and now I'm dying. And I know what you will do, and it will be a disappointment. And you could have been blessed, but you'll be cursed, but God will be faithful. Stay close to him. That's Moses' sermon. Deuteronomy as a constitution sets forth the expectations of God and his people in relationship to one another. And Deuteronomy as prophecy foretells the future history of Israel. 
the cycle of judges, the downward cycle of everybody doing what was right in his own eyes is spoken of in chapter 12. The fact that Israel would have a king rejecting God and the theocracy, and that is predicted in Deuteronomy 17. And then instructions are given to those kings. False prophets are predicted in chapters 13 and 18. The idolatries of Israel are all over the book of Deuteronomy, but chapters 17 and 18 in particular. The siege of Jerusalem is foretold in Deuteronomy 28, including the cannibalizing of their own children. The exile is predicted in chapters 28 and 29. Repentance during the exile is predicted in chapter 30. Return from the exile is predicted in chapter 30. And then a distant future return from future exiles is predicted in chapter 30. The coming of Christ is spoken of in Deuteronomy 18. And the new covenant and the distant future national repentance of Israel, their restoration to the land, and all the outstanding promised blessings fulfilled is spoken of in Deuteronomy 30. So Deuteronomy, think about this, before they've entered the land, before they've started their sacrificial system in Jerusalem, before they have kings, before they go into exile, before they return from exile, all of these things are spoken of before. It's not as if Israel's condition is a big surprise to God. God has already diagnosed the problem of the human heart. And the tendency to be wayward in these things. Deuteronomy warns about it, foretells it. The prophets point it out and Daniel confesses it. That's the relationship. Daniel was clearly familiar with the nation's constitution. Moses' final sermon, the Old Testament Romans. The vocabulary, the themes, the phrases of Deuteronomy are all through this prayer in Daniel 9. Let's look at an outline of Daniel's prayer I have the kind of four-part outline for you up there on the screen. The first is adoration. Daniel begins with worship. And then there's a section of confession, and this is a confession, yes, we've sinned. And then a second section of confession, which is, yes, God's judgment is appropriate. And then finally, Daniel's petition. Daniel asking the Lord for help. We'll look at those first two this evening. Let's look at this section of adoration in Daniel's prayer. Look down with me in your Bibles, Daniel 9, 4. I prayed to Yahweh my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and loving kindness for those who love Him and keep His commandments. Daniel begins just announcing, I, I prayed to Yahweh my God. And again, Daniel doesn't use the personal name of God, Yahweh, anywhere but this chapter. And it appears a number of times here in Daniel 9. Yahweh is the divine name. It is the covenant-keeping God of Israel. This is a contrast to all other gods, the gods of Babylon and anywhere else. And this is God's personal name that he gave to his people. Daniel follows up that personal name, Yahweh, by saying, Yahweh, my God. That is Daniel expressing his own personal ownership of and ownership by Almighty God, the God of the universe, in a personal relationship with a sinner. And Daniel says, and I confessed. Literally, he cast before Yahweh. This is a word that describes the casting of sins in confession in a solemn way before God. And Daniel says in verse 4, Alas, O Adonai, alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God. This word for alas, it's a really a rough translation of something like, Oh, please, I beseech thee. It's an interjection of pleading. And, and here Daniel calls God Adonai, that is master or Lord, the one in charge. And then he says, he is the great and awesome God. Great simply means big. Awesome comes from a verb to fear. The noun form here is that which is to be feared. The awe-inspiring one. The terrible one who's terrible, awful in terms of awe-inspiring, terror-striking nature draws us close rather than repels. He is the one who is to be feared, and, and yet we run to him. And Daniel says, he is the one who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. 
This is the covenant-keeping God and the word for loving kindness, that Hebrew word for grace. God's initiating expression of love to those who do not deserve it. And who, with whom does God keep covenant and loving kindness? Those who love Him and keep His commandments. This is what's expressed in the book of Deuteronomy. Love me, cling to me in faith, and I will bless you. Listen to Deuteronomy 4.31. For Yahweh your God is a compassionate God. That implies you're going to fail and he's going to have compassion. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. Deuteronomy 7.12. It will come about because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that Yahweh your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness which he swore. It's exactly what Daniel prays right here. He is the God who keeps covenant. He is the God of loving kindness to those who love him and keep his commandments. This is something like Romans 8, 28. God works together all things for good to those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. This is not a, a universal promise of God's unfettered goodness for everything that moves, but God's special love for his people who are in relationship to him. By the way, I love this pattern in Daniel here that this prayer that obviously is pressing deeply on Daniel's heart, this need for intercessory prayer on behalf of God's people begins with adoration. Not every prayer in the Bible starts this way, but, but many of them do. Some ascription of God's attributes precede the petitions. And I like this pattern. What do we see of God's attributes here in verse 4? The lordship of God, the power of God embedded in the word El for almighty, the greatness of God, the terror of God, the faithfulness of God, God's grace, his chesed or his loving kindness. All of these are bound up in this opening phrase of Daniel's prayer. Dale Ralph Davis describes God this way from this verse, he is fearful and faithful. He is the God who simultaneously makes us tremble and keeps us secure. And we have these patterns throughout Scripture. He is the lion and the lamb. He is the biggest and scariest anywhere, and if he's on your side, there's nothing else to fear. Daniel moves in verse 5 from adoration to confession. Notice what he says, verse 5, we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and your ordinances. Notice first of all that Daniel includes himself in this confession. It's like Isaiah does in Isaiah chapter 6, he says, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Isaiah was Probably the holiest guy in Israel when he came face to face with Almighty God and was on his face like a dead man. Whatever Isaiah's relative goodness in relationship to other Israelites, he was a sinner in the presence of a holy God and worthy of death and destruction and eternal judgment. And he recognized it. And God forgave his sin. Similarly here, Daniel includes himself in this confession of sin along with the people. And we don't have a record uh, uniquely of, of Daniel of anything in Scripture that indicts him of some observable sin that we could see in the narrative. And yet Daniel knows that he's a sinner. Daniel confesses his sins along with the people. And you get this string of sin synonyms. All the vocabulary of sin and its various angles piled up here. We sinned, we committed iniquity, we acted wickedly, we rebelled, we turned aside. And these five verbs are just back to back to back to back to back in this text. Uh, connected with simple conjunctions. And we sinned and we committed iniquity and we acted wickedly and we rebelled. The last one's a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a moment. To sin here is to miss the mark. Committing iniquity is a, a word meaning to twist or pervert or to bend. It is the opposite of walking a straight way. It is walking a perverted path or a bent path. 
to act, wicked, act wickedly in verse 5 is outward criminality, to do what is a known wrong, to be obviously guilty of wickedness deserving punishment. And to rebel is this disobedient revolt. And that heart of rebellion uh, is seen even as Israel is under the curse of God. Listen to Deuteronomy 29, 19. It shall be when a man hears the words of this curse that he will boast, saying, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart in order to destroy the water, uh, watered land with the dry. What does that mean? In part, when the delay of sentence means that you don't immediately get disciplined for the sin, the consequences may be delayed because of God's mercy, a man can boast, hey, I'm walking in peace. And even when the curse comes, that stubbornness of heart is not removed. There's a very real danger and lesson for us in that. God said, this is what Israel is going to do. I'm pronouncing these curses if they disobey. They're going to walk in stubbornness. They're going to say, I've got peace right now, so I'm not turning. And even when the curse comes, I'm still not turning. You may think that you can delay repentance or delay a soft-hearted approach to God, thinking that someday I'll turn to Him, someday I'll yield. And you may not have that someday. You've underestimated sin's deception and the sin that entangles. In fact, it's striking when you get to the worst judgment on earth prior to the lake of fire in the great tribulation. You have people that know that it is Jesus in Revelation chapter 6 pouring out his wrath on the earth and they would not repent of their idolatries. And they said, let the rocks fall on us because the wrath of the Lamb has come. They'd rather die in their unrepentance and their hard-heartedness than yield and acknowledge their Creator. What a tragic situation. Daniel, familiar with Deuteronomy, is recognizing these things and confessing this national rebellion. And then notice what he says in verse 5, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. And that even turning is a, an indication that the verb form here is different than the previous four. This fifth verb in a row in Hebrew is, is unique from the others. And this is an indication that how did we end up missing the mark? How did we pursue perversions? How did we incur guilt for wicked behavior? How did we rebel against the Lord at every turn? By turning aside from God's word. This fifth verb is the foundation, the spring, the source of the four that went before. And I think Daniel has in mind here the Torah, Mosaic law, that is the constitutional foundation of the nation, God's expectation of his people. How did they turn to all the vile sins that led them into exile? By rejecting God's word, turning aside from God's word. It's the starting point of all those other categories. It's exactly what Moses said in Deuteronomy 28. There will be blessings for you if you listen to the commands of Yahweh your God, which I charge you today, to observe them carefully. And do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Daniel picks up on that very same phrase and confesses, just what Moses said, that's what we did. And, and that turning aside from God's word is the source of all this other sin. This thought continues into verse 6. Look down, Daniel prays, Moreover, we have not listened to your slaves, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. There is a relationship between sin and reading your Bible. Do you know this, Christian? There's a relationship between sin and prayer. There's a relationship between sin and seeking God, listening to God and His Word. Sin makes the heart grow cold. And a cold heart is a lessened appetite for seeking God and His Word. And you know this vicious cycle, Christian. I, I know you know it. Sin is an infection that makes you avoid the cure. 
And part of sin's deception is to keep you from the remedy, to hate the doctor, to spit out the medicine, to long for more infection. Sin is a madness. It is an insanity. And, and sin itself puts up protective barriers from the very thing that would eradicate sin and put sin to death, humbly seeking the Lord. Go to him in prayer. Go to listen to him in his word. It's a simple remedy. What should you and I do when we feel our own hearts grow cold to the things of the Lord? Just what we see here in this passage. Confess sin. Pray. Reflect on God's word. All of that's wrapped up here in Daniel 9. Look, sin is shameful. Sin produces shame. We'll see this over and over again in this prayer. And, and what do we, when we are ashamed, want to do? Run away, hide, maybe let time do some work? Time doesn't fix sin. Repentance does. And how blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered? How do you get that? By running away in shame? No, by turning back to the Lord who is gracious and compassionate and keeps covenant. This is Daniel's appeal here. Sin lies. Sin wants you to stay under sin. It never delivers on its promises. And think about how Daniel says this. We have not listened to your slaves, the prophets. That's an interesting way to talk about how God's word came to a rebellious and obstinate, hard-hearted people. God sent prophets, mouthpieces, spokesmen, who were his servants, his slaves. The prophets were sent by God to say and to say only what God commanded. They weren't at liberty to add or subtract. In fact, the death penalty was required for those who did such things. They were simply to speak the truth. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to be a spokesperson for God amidst an obstinate people who didn't want to listen? What was it like for Jeremiah, who amongst the people of Israel had zero listeners, zero converts in a 40-year prophetic ministry? Now, Ebed-Melech, the foreigner, his guard, listened and actually spoke truth on the basis of God's word to encourage Jeremiah and even rescued him from his own countrymen. I think about Elijah under Ahab and Jezebel. Jeremiah actually was uh, rounded up by the priests and the prophets in Jeremiah 26, and they said, he must die. Think about Moses' treatment by the wilderness generation. These slaves, the prophets, would speak their master's words. And if people didn't want to hear from God, they took it out on the messenger. And notice what Daniel says about them. They spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people. That is, the word of God was heard and ignored, neglected, rejected, even cut in pieces and burned in the fire. Listen to Deuteronomy 29. Moses says to all the people assembled in this last sermonic, prophetic, constitutional reading, you stand today, all of you, before Yahweh your God, your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the alien who is within your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with Yahweh your God, into his oath which Yahweh your God is making with you today, in order that he may establish you as his people, and that he may be your God, just as he spoke to you and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. What a gracious, initiating kindness of God to say, I will go with you, I'll defeat your enemies, I'll put you into this land, make it like the Garden of, en uh, uh, Garden of Eden, and I'll make you prosper. It's going to be great. And all of you stand before Yahweh today, from the kings down to the lowest in the land, the, the chiefs to the common people, all of you listening, 
Daniel is obviously appealing to this appeal in his prayer. I find it interesting in the book of Deuteronomy, the specific instructions from God to have the word of God read. First of all, this instruction comes to the kings, Deuteronomy 17. When you enter the land which Yahweh your God gives you, and you possess it, and you live in it, and you say, you say, you people, I will set a king over me like the nations who are around me. And you know the story. Israel rejected God as king. They rejected the pure theocracy. And they wanted to be cool like all the other kids. They wanted to have a king like all the other countries had a king. And so when you put a king over you, you will set a king over you whom Yahweh your God chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Now it shall come about, Deuteronomy 17, 18, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh as God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, so that his heart would not be lifted up above his countrymen, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. Direct command to kings. What was a king supposed to do on inauguration day? Write out by hand his own personal copy of the Bible in the presence of the priests and Levites. I wonder how many times that happened. Listen to this direction to the people, Deuteronomy 27. So it will be on the day when you cross the Jordan to the land which Yahweh your God gives you, you will set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime, and you will write on them, on the lime-coated stones, all the words of the law, when you cross over, so that you may enter the land which Yahweh your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as Yahweh the God of your fathers promised you. Listen, they're all supposed to sort of carry pocket constitutions. Make a pile of stones, cover them with lime, and write the whole thing out on the rocks, right when they enter the land. Listen to this instruction to the Levites and the elders in Deuteronomy 27. It will be on the very day when you cross the Jordan to the land which Yahweh your God gives you, you shall set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime and write on them all the words of the law for this land that the Lord your God gives you. I think I just read that. Didn't I just read that? Yes, I did. That's in there twice. It's important. They should have done it twice, I guess. The people, uh, Deuteronomy 6, had this responsibility. These words, Moses says, which I'm commanded you today, either the Shema there which is the hero Israel, Yahweh is one, um, love Yahweh with all your heart, um, or perhaps the entire Mosaic law. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You will bind them as a sign on your hand. They will be as frontals on your forehead. You will write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." From the kings, to the spiritual leaders of the land, to the fathers, to all the people, they were to put God's word in front of them all the time. How did they do? Well, they persecuted the prophets, burned the Bible, buried it in the rubble of the temple. It's interesting in Ezra 9 and Nehemiah 9, two very similar prayers of confession Daniel 9, Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9. Easy way to remember it. They add to this list the priests. The kings, the princes, the fathers, all the people, and the priests have all failed at keeping God's word in front of us. And look at verse 7. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame. This is such an important sentence, and this is going to be a preview of the confession that we'll look at uh, next time. But the exile is just. It's right. And the exile was just as promised. This is exactly what God said would happen if the people disobeyed. This is a preview of the second section of Daniel's confession in verses 11 to 14. In other words, God is not to be blamed for the sorry state of Israel in any way. Israel's 
abandonment, Israel's exile, the, the ramshackle state of the temple in Jerusalem, the northern tribes hauled off to Assyria, the rebels in Judea fleeing to Egypt and almost all of them dying there. Israel being overwhelmed and abused by foreign nations. All of this is just as God promised. In no way does this situation diminish God's attributes or besmirch his character. God is not small nor powerless. Remember, this is one of the great themes of the book of Daniel. Daniel is making the case that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the only God. And Israel is not in Babylon because the gods of Babylon were stronger than Yahweh. Israel is in Babylon because they were unfaithful to Yahweh. The gods of Babylon are nothings. But none of this besmirches God's character. Friends, think about your own heart's response to affliction. What does your heart do when things aren't going the way you would like for them to go? Some trial, some discipline, some affliction, some hardship, some unexpected tragedy. Does it cause you to doubt God's greatness or his goodness? God's not big enough to deal with this, not powerful enough. He doesn't see his attributes are all out the window. Or God's not good. I know better than God right now how this situation should have unfolded. I deserve better than this affliction. I have a better bead on the history and the unfolding of the universe and how the grand plan should go because God's not following what I think should be done. Our hearts go right down this path. You've got to fortify your heart right now for affliction to come. God never does his people wrong. And in reality, we never get what we deserve, not in this life. We're always better than we deserve. And notice the stark contrast. Righteousness belongs to you, O Adonai, O Lord, but to us, open shame. This is striking in the original. This is like Paul's statement in Romans, let God be true and every man a liar. God is vindicated in the exile. We're the ones that deserve the shame. This is exactly what Moses said in Deuteronomy 32. The rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. We have acted corruptly toward him. Moses understood this. And interestingly, Deuteronomy 32 happens after Deuteronomy 28, where Moses says, if you obey him, you get to stay in the land and be blessed. And if you disobey him, you're going to be exiled from the land and be under the cursings. And I know that you will disobey him. And I know God is faithful and he will bring you back. Again, none of that a surprise, but the weight of responsibility is not on God's failure to be big enough to protect Israel from the other gods and the other nations. Nor is it a besmirching of God's goodness that he doesn't know what he's doing. No, all of the blame is on God's faithless people. So literally, the Hebrew here reads, shame of the faces to us. Open shame on us. And what is this open shame? They've been humbled. Over successive generations, stripped of the valuables in Jerusalem. Surrounded by powerful armies, paying excessive heavy tribute to foreign nations, sort of an international extortion. They were besieged, dominated, decimated, and then carried off as captives into exile. Abject humiliation. And Daniel adds in verse 7, as to this day. The men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, near and far, in all the countries to which you have driven them. These past sins have resulted in present humiliation. The ones in Judea were taken off to Babylonian captivity. The pitiful leftovers of the Jews remaining in Jerusalem are in abject poverty. You can look up Jeremiah 14, 1-6 for the dire state of their condition there. And then the all Israel near and far and all the other countries which you've driven them. Uh, there were some who said, no, we'll trust in Egypt. And they went to Egypt and died there. There were those in Assyria and Babylon, but also in the other territories that the Assyrians and Babylonians had conquered. 
Nebuchadnezzar was famous for taking captives from one city and dispersing them all throughout the territories he ran. That was true of Jews. Why again were they so humiliated? Daniel says in this confession, the end of verse 7, because of their unfaithful deeds which they've committed. Literally, the Hebrew is because of their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful. It's emphatic. Notice in verse 8, open shame belongs to us, O Yahweh, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Again, the kings, princes, fathers, everyone's included here. Rank, status, privilege, wealth, they are all leveled by sin and its consequences. No one escaped God's watchful eye. No one had enough clout to escape his judgment. All faced the consequences for their sins. And the kings and the princes and the fathers in particular had been given so much, so much truth, so much opportunity, so much responsibility, squandered. And at great cost to all those under their leadership. Think about the first three kings Israel had. Saul, David, and Solomon. Of course, after that is the split between the northern and southern. In the north, Jeroboam, Nadab, Elah, Zimri, Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, Joram, Jehu, Jehoahaz, Jehoash, a second Jeroboam, Zechariah, Shalom, Menachem, Pekiah, Pekah, Hosea. From 931 to 722 BC, not a single king of the northern tribes was pleasing to the Lord. Zero. That's a lot of kings, a lot of leadership, a lot of failure for God's special people. Despite God's patient pleadings with his people, it's not as if he left himself without voice in the northern tribes. Micaiah, Elijah, Elisha, Hosea, Amos, and Micah all spoke God's gracious words pleading with them. And think about that, 931 to 722 BC from the split, and Jeroboam was the first, and every evil king of the northern tribes after him was said to follow in the sins of Jeroboam. It's almost like his name became a verb. They all Jeroboamed after him. And how long did God persist? How long did God plead with them and have compassion upon them? How patient was he? In the south of 19 kings and one really evil queen, 12 of those leaders were evil. Two seemed like they repented near the end of life. Only eight of them were commended for pleasing the Lord in the text of Scripture. And two of those fell away when the prophet who was near to them giving godly counsel was off the scene. We think of young Josiah as a hero king, and he certainly was. But Josiah as an eight-year-old newly enthroned king of Israel, in the Davidic line, in the tribe of Judah, Overseeing the, the southern side. His heroic kingship is in itself an indictment against the history of Israel. You see, the Bible was found in the rubble of the temple complex during a construction project. And young King Josiah read the whole law, read the whole lot of the people, tore his robes, instituted a national repentance, realizing, hey, the... The king was supposed to read this and write the whole thing out and then read it to the people. And the people are supposed to be reading it. And the Levites and the priests are supposed to be reading the word of God to the people. And every father in his own home is supposed to be putting these things before his own family. What have we been doing? And reinstituted much, although not all, of the constitutional requirements for the people. Think about the fact that God's word had been lost, such that it was a strange book that was found in the rubble of the temple. How shocking would it have been to read it and to discover how far off we were? Daniel was a young boy during Josiah's national repentance. So he saw a king lead the people to submit to God's word for the first time in a long time. And Daniel saw the hand of God's judgment stayed as a result. In other words, God delayed necessary judgment because there was hope. There was a turn. There was a humble heart. 
No doubt that would have stuck in Daniel's mind, would inform his prayer. The overall history of Israel's leadership was not good. And what might we expect? In Israel's first king, we have Saul as an example. He utterly failed to love Yahweh, though he had remarkable access and privilege. But he turned to mediums, murder, and national rebellion. Think about Israel's second king, Solomon. 1 Kings 8, we've already looked at 1 Kings 8 influence on Daniel. Solomon's dedicatory prayer at the temple complex where he says, there's no God but Yahweh and all the nations will stream to Israel and worship him if we do this right. So people do this right. Three chapters later, Solomon joined himself to foreign women and set up altars to their gods in Jerusalem and Judea. What a tragic example. Even sacrificing his own kids ostensibly set up altars to Molech. And then we know of David's example. This was a man who loved God from the heart. But he had to write songs like song 51 and song number 32 in the hymnal. Where where the, the same vocabulary of sin synonyms show up in those psalms of David's personal repentance of visible national rebellion against Yahweh that had consequences that lasted for the rest of Israel's history. And then things only got worse from there. This massive national institutional failure, despite having God's word, the Torah and the prophets, the constitutional document that set up the expectation, and then those gracious reminders from God saying, hey, remember, don't forget. You're forgetting. And look at verse 9. To the Lord, to Adonai our God, belong compassion and forgiveness for we have rebelled against him. Compassion and forgiveness are both Hebrew, are both plurals in Hebrew here. To God belong compassions and forgivenesses. Look, we're not talking about one sin. We're talking about hundreds of years for both the north and the south, much longer for the south. A long train of rebellion under the lavish long suffering of God. Shameful indeed was it when the people of Israel had on their side the one true God who promised to bless them, to remove all their enemies, to provide for them material prosperity, would they only cling to him in faith. Listen to Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't tremble at your enemies. For Yahweh, your God, is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. God promised not to fail them. And only the God of Israel could keep such a promise. And yet they turned to false gods of the nations around them, which were no gods at all. Emptinesses, deceptions, nothings. And Daniel confesses, for we have rebelled against him. How crazy is that? How insane is sin to rebel against goodness? To turn your back on remedy? To despise the physician, when you are otherwise incurably infected. Verse 10, Daniel confesses, We have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh our God, to walk in his teachings which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. This is really interesting phraseology in Daniel's confession. Obey so as to walk. This and other phrases in this prayer are reminiscent of the the Deuteronomic phrases, listen so as to do, keep to do, hear to keep, listen to obey. I won't read all of them for you. I counted this week 49 times in the book of Deuteronomy these kinds of phrases. I want to turn your attention to Deuteronomy 4. Because what you see in just a few verses back to back is the pattern of that whole book. Deuteronomy 4.1, now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, is giving to you. Deuteronomy 4.5, see, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as Yahweh, my God, commanded me, that you should do thus. Verse 6, so keep and do them. 
For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples. God didn't give his instructions to Israel as some sort of a bummer, but a gracious way for his people to draw near to him. For the one true God, the the maker of the universe, the, the mighty one who is between the wings of the cherubim in fire and terror to actually be in their midst and to be on their side and not destroy them. And so just listen and listen to do, listen to obey. And do so with sincerity of heart, not, not just externals. Deuteronomy 26, 19, uh, love the Lord your God with your heart. Interestingly, in Deuteronomy 26, the people say, we will. And God says, and if you do, I will bless you. And this all was to be done on the basis of love towards God and, and clinging to him in faith. Listen to Deuteronomy 30, verse 20. Choose life in order that you may live by loving Yahweh your God, by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days that you may live in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers. Listen, all of this in Deuteronomy is the backdrop of Daniel's prayer. Can you understand his heart in praying what he's praying? Worshiping Yahweh for his attributes, reflecting on the truths of who God is and his unchangeable nature, and then reflecting on his own heart and the people. We have sinned. It's our fault. Look how we've rebelled against God's grace, his chesed, his loving kindness. And he's been so compassionate. His forgivenesses and compassions are many. Look how much time has elapsed while we've pursued idolatries. What a gracious God. Israel, turn. We're in exile because of our rebellions. Time was almost up on the exile. We're going back. Oh God, would you turn the people's hearts? I don't think Daniel was convinced that the exile had rooted out the idolatries of the heart nationally for Israel yet. And of course, that would prove true. Daniel's already given us his vision of the successive empires where Israel would be under the thumb not yet sovereign, not back in the land with autonomy, not yet receiving the material blessings God had promised, and not yet receiving the circumcision of heart that Deuteronomy 10 demands. In Deuteronomy 10, God said, the requirements of God are not that hard. Just obey him. Just do what he says. And circumcise your hearts so that you'll do what he says. In other words, a supernatural work internally at the heart level, is required to do these things God's laying out in constitutional form. It's a heavy expectation in Deuteronomy 10. And in Deuteronomy 30, after the promises for blessings if you obey, and the curses if you disobey, and then the prophecy that you won't obey, and then the prophecy that God and His faithfulness will bring you back to the land, God also promises in Deuteronomy 30, I will circumcise your hearts. That's the promise of the new covenant. Shows up again in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 and 37 and is found, of course, in Messiah. The very thing God promised to Israel is the very supernatural principle that God works in the heart through new birth in us Gentiles who as unnatural branches in a wild olive grove, not connected to the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, get grafted into those promises, that rich root of the olive tree, and we get to benefit from the spiritual promises, those spiritual supernatural blessings God made to Israel. The we outsiders, we get to partake in a new heart, circumcised heart. Soft heart of flesh, not of stone. Because God does an initiating work of His grace in our hearts. So that we cling to Him by faith and we want to do what He says. Without which we wouldn't want to do what He says. And Daniel knows that the day is coming for Israel's national repentance when they too, like those branches cut off for unbelief on the ground in the olive grove, get grafted in again by God's grace. Romans eleven twenty seven. 27, that day when all 
Israel will be saved. Do you think, we talked about the, the compression of prophetic material. Deuteronomy 30 talks about a near return from exile and a distant return from exile back to back. I'm not sure Daniel saw the space between those two. Do you think it's possible that Daniel is pleading for this national heart repentance and circumcision of heart even in this prayer in Daniel 9? It is a prayer that will be answered one day. Uh, Disappointingly, not in Daniel's generation. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this recorded prayer out of the heart of your prophet reflecting on the truths of your word, clinging to your promises, aware of your promises, not only to judge in faithfulness to your character, but also to redeem in grace according to your faithfulness to covenant. God, may our hearts be like Daniel's heart in prayer, recognizing our own sins, confessing our own sins to you, not running away in shame and hiding from you the only remedy, but running with open hands, recognizing the vileness of our thoughts and deeds and motives and actions before you. Running to the only hope of forgiveness, which of course we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to a cross to pay for our sins, to open doors of hope where there was only shame, forgiveness where there was only condemnation, and a right relationship to you. The great promise you've made to sinners that you would be our God and we could be your people if we would come to you by faith on your terms. Thank you, O Lord, for this prayer. May it it be a motivator for us to pray and to pray even with a heart after your own, reflecting on the truths that you've given. We ask these things in Christ's name who makes it all possible. Amen.